everybody. Welcome to another live stream of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. Thanks for sticking with us through any technical difficulties there. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, you can send in any questions you may have throughout this podcast or throughout this whole recording. Uh, you can just throw them into the comments. And then after this, what we'll do is we'll go through those those comments that you've sent in and we'll answer as many of them as we possibly can uh, with the time that we have. Uh, so with that, let's get into the proper podcast, shall we? Mm -hmm. Welcome to the podcast is dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I am coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Zimmerman. Hi everybody. Our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. Hello. You feel extra tall today, Nate. I was, I was actually kind of bending down to get to this. Pause. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there we go. Yeah. Um, but welcome to the podcast that is dedicated, like I said, to making a faster cyclist. You can submit your training questions to trainerroadcom slash podcast. We'll go through those questions and we will put them into a feed. Uh, we don't get to all of them. However, we do read all of them and uh, we put a handful of them into a feed every week and, and try to answer them. So before we do that, we definitely have a number of different things to cover. Uh, first of all, yesterday morning, uh, well, yesterday, it's an exciting day for us. Very exciting. Big, big release. Yeah. We launched performance analytics. Yep. A set of features we've been working on for a while. Yeah. So we did a whole live stream about it yesterday. And if you want to get all the details on it, go to uh, youtube.com slash trainer road. We went through uh, my career. We went, we analyzed some of our races. We, we showed you like how you could use this to get faster. Look at your own data. Um, some of those questions you might think, oh, I need a coach. No, like it's all there. You can, mm -hmm. you can pretty much do 95% of the stuff that you need to do um, <clears throat> yourself without going like really deep into the weeds. Right. Um, but on this one, uh, th sorry. So that's the long version. There's also a condensed version on blog.trainerroad.com. And that's a shorter read. I think we went over an hour on mm -hmm. our podcast yesterday. Hour 20. Yeah. But I'd like to just quickly. <laughs> Chad counted. <laughs> it's hour 21. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, the best hour 21 of your life. <laughs> and Chad was drinking. I was drinking. Champagne. It was a great time. Yeah. But on this one, I, we just want to do a real quick overview of what it is. Mm. Basically, before we've had performance training, and now this is like the second uh, leg of our uh, platform, which is performance analytics. And it has, it's based around three major areas. One is a redesigned career page with a training stress graph. So now we're gonna, I'm bearing the lead here, we're pulling in all of your workouts from Strava and Garmin. So if you sync, you go to your profile, your account section, there's something called ride sync. And if you hook up Strava and Garmin, we'll pull in all your outside ride data. And we cleverly try to remove duplicates as well. Oh yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. So DC Renee did an article and he has more duplicates than any of y'all. <laughs> he can't even see a stem or handlebars on his bike. All you see are head units. Yep. Just <laughs> and he went through it and he didn't have duplicates. Yeah. So our duplicate logic is on point. Yeah. But, if, but if it's not, email support at trainer.com. <laughs> yes. Um, and we'll get that, that part of it fixed, improved. Uh, so don't worry about it. You can connect both Garmin and Strava. If you mm -hmm. sync Strava, we'll pull in all of your data. If you sync Garmin, we'll pull in the next, the last 30 days of your rides. Mm -hmm. That's the thing with the Garmin API that we can't get around. You can also drop in files. So the, the main areas are the career page that has uh, it's updated cleaner career page with a training stress chart. It's a really good way to look at your, like the shape of how you've been working out over, uh, up to four years. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind this is to like, what kind of behavior can I do to have a better FTP? Mm -hmm. Because you can't just say, I want a better FTP. Mm -hmm. You have to do something, right? You have to have mm -hmm. some goals and yeah. a, uh, process goals as you go through. Mm -hmm. um, the next part is we redid personal records. And I think we have the best personal records of anyone out there. And here's why. The first part is we have very small granularity. Mm -hmm. um, other some, I think Strava has this but a lot of platforms don't. And we didn't have this before where we, you'd have like a one bucket a, or, or one minute, a two minute, a five minute, a 10 minute. And we actually go by seconds down at the small end, then second it jumps to five second uh, uh, increments at a certain spot too. Yeah. But you would have a hill climb that's like four minutes and 32 seconds. Yeah. And uh, you would never get PRs for that, even if you were putting out more power. Because you have like two, you have your two minute PR and then you have your five minute PR, but then you don't have your four or three. Exactly. <laughs> no idea what goes on in between there. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's not revolutionary at all. But what we did do is we added the concept of seasons. So as cyclists, we don't train like usually in year, like at January yeah. 1st to December 31st. Changes every year. Or the last six weeks. Yeah. So what we did is we have the ability to specify a time and a season to say like, 
my road season is going to start in November and end in July. Mm -hmm. And then during that season, we're going to give you, we're going to track your, every time you got a new power PR during that season, it's easy to see that. And the reason why that's cool is, is fitness is cyclical. And if you listen to the podcast for a while, Chad said this a bazillion times is that, uh, you peak for your a race and then usually you take a little bit of time off your fitness comes down, but you're at a higher level than last year, a higher starting level. Yep. Mm -hmm. So by doing these seasons, you are going to be able to see that you keep progressing mm -hmm. just during that season. Mm -hmm. The next part to that same point we just talked about is we have another feature called season match. So if you have two seasons, you have your, let's say your mountain bike 2018 season and your mountain bike 2017 season. If you turn on season match, what we do is we, depending on the, where you are in your current season, we uh, compare that to the exact point in time in your last season. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, let's say I'm seven weeks into my 2018 season. You know, it's long, it's say it's 40 weeks. Yeah. If I turn on season match, it's gonna compare that to the same seven week PRs of my 2017 season. And here's why that's interesting is because if you just start out and you have a long year and you were really fit the previous year, let's say, uh, but you'd start out like that, you're probably not going to see much progress in terms of PRs right off the bat, right? Uh, None. You might not get any until your A race. Yep. So mm -hmm. then, but then when you turn on season match, you see, oh, okay, at this exact point in my training last year or last season, I am actually further ahead than where I was. Or hopefully you're not seeing that you're further behind, but if so, mm -hmm. time to make changes. Well, yeah, you can identify weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also do like a spring versus fall, right? Like spring mountain bike versus fall cyclocross. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about, you could do it in stage races to see how you compare and how you drop off in that. Mm -hmm. Yep. A whole bunch of stuff. Again, a lot more you can do with that. Watch our live stream. That's the best. Or go to how much will all of these improvements cost our subscribers? <laughs> well, <laughs> Chad, <Very good> Chad. <laughs> let me get to that one second, but it seems like it's going to be a lot. Uh, <laughs> the you the should last just part call of it, that one right now. <laughs> no, it's got to tease it. <laughs> okay. Because this is a lot of value. <laughs> okay. Sorry, this is a, like, yeah. Okay. This is a lot of a stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, Chad. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gotcha. <laughs> there's also um, we redid the uh, our ride page. So now Ooh, yeah. this has bugged me for a long time. Is I haven't had a platform that I really like to be able to like slice and dice my power data mm -hmm. and specifically our like just your power data. Mm -hmm. um, so on the ride page, you can. You can uh, select certain sections of your ride. You can zoom in. You can edit the handles, which is a small feature, but so needed. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can add custom intervals. So a lot of times during races, you don't have to, you're not able to hit lap the whole time. Yeah, like, totally. You don't, Cross racing? Like almost uh, all racing, race. right? Great. Yeah. <laughs> training, yeah. you can do it. But other than that, like it's really hard to hit yeah. lap every time. And even in training, you might want to do custom stuff. Yeah. But you can create custom intervals and select it. Um, there's, again, there's a whole bunch of features Tons on side the ride page. So all of this is now active and live in everyone's account. And this is basically a whole nother platform that should cost an extra amount of money. Yeah. But it's all free or not free, included. <laughs> included, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. all included in the membership. So we will do a price increase sometime, um, but that today is not that day. So, and that will come, that won't just be, you know, that that's, that's because we'll be working on other things. So, yep. And yeah. the idea that uh, we've always done with price increases and I've planned on doing this forever is that anyone who's currently signed up, if we do a price increase, gets to be grandfathered in forever. I don't like it where you it's stay, like- Stay at the current pricing. Exactly. I think people who are who have been like committed and supporting the company earlier- mm -hmm. um, Should be just, rewarded in some Exactly. Respect, and yeah. just like you're grandfathered in. Yeah. It's like rent totally. control. Yeah. Um, some other companies, they'll like raise it to you later because they want more money, but yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to do for people. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. That is it. Again, go to uh, youtube.com slash trainer road or blog.trainerroad.com to learn more. Yep. Absolutely. It's really a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Lots. Yeah. Um, and then I guess the next uh, bit of thing, Nate, did you have something that you wanted to throw in a quick correction? Yep. Um, it's a coffee correction, yep. I guess, huh? Clint from Bike A Latte Co. He makes uh, cold brew pre ride like shots that taste delicious with sugar in it. Hmm. Um, he corrected me on my coffee problem because I said that dark roasts have less caffeine. Okay. And what it is is dark roasts have less caffeine by volume. And so if you go to a, a standard coffee shop where they, they measure their coffee by volume, mm -hmm. or I'm guessing probably K-Cups are by volume too. Mm -hmm. Like, so you go to Starbucks, it's by volume. Mm -hmm. um, 
dark roast will have less. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a, uh, he says like third world, it's those like hipster places where you order coffee. It takes 10 minutes, but it's the best coffee you've ever had. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, they always weigh it and they put it on a scale. And if it's by the same weight, uh. it's the same amount of caffeine. Oh. So um, something in the, 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 the process makes it have... Uh, Interesting. Uh, I forget what it is, but anyways. Coffee nerdery. Coffee, so coffee by volume versus coffee by weight. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting stuff. Or <laughs> coffee by Did mass. Not know that. Okay. But that's the... I'm sure that's that, a real scientific yeah. way instead <laughs> of saying weight, but... We're, we're getting deep into it. Um, something that we did over the weekend... Uh, this past weekend, we did the, we've been calling it the Segondo. I think it's the Peter Sagan Dirt Fondo is the official name. Mm-hmm. It was up, it was really close to our office, which is great here in Reno. Well, it was in Truckee, California, which is about a half hour from Reno, Nevada. And this race was a ton of fun. In fact, it might've been the most fun race I've ever done. And I know you guys are saying it's a Fondo, it's not a race. Now it was competitive. No, there were, it, was no it says prizes. on their website, it says, this is a race. Yep, yeah. absolutely. There were some people that didn't race it. Um, even some people in this room that didn't race it, but there were others that definitely did race it. So um, it was a ton of fun. Kurt Gensheimer just designed the course. He's known as the angry Best single course. speeder. Yeah, and he, ever. so good. And he's really involved with like Downeyville and like a lot of gnarly technical mountain bike stuff. And this course was like so good. It had a lot of road mm-hmm. for the the dirt fondo that it was supposed to be. So that kind of made you question which bike you should get. And then the dirt sections were smooth in some parts. And then there was one section that was basically a rock garden for mm-hmm. about two miles going uphill. It was extremely rough. There was single track, but then there was also, you know, smooth flowy descent stuff. There was mud mm-hmm. or creek crossings. It was a crowd pleaser of a course. There yeah. was something you're going to love and probably nothing you'll absolutely hate. I think some people hated the boneyard. That <laughs> yeah, so you walk it. I mean, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I liked about it, two, two parts is one, it was always changing. Mm-hmm. So you always had like very different kind of terrain. Yep. And two, there was nothing in there that made me feel like I was scared for my life. Yeah. But, yeah, but nothing unsafe. things okay. were challenging and like tech, like the uphill, uphill technical riding, you don't, you're not going to die. Yeah. And there wasn't a cliff drop off or something, yeah. right. but it was, it was like, oh, this is challenging. This yeah. is gonna, This is fun. And it's this, hard. this introduced a new hard. beat Pete challenge, a different Pete, uh, a Peter Sagan challenge, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we all started, uh, I, I should say a handful of us started right at the front and then a handful of us, then the other, uh, half started toward the back and Nate, you and I were toward the front. And when we started out, did you, it got, it was on the road at first and then it got really wild. And, and once we got to the dirt and I want to talk about a few takeaways from that, but did you yeah. see any crashes? Well, I was, I think I was in I, front of them, but. I don't know why this always happens to me, but <laughs> there was one crash a, a little bit in front of me and you know, we think somebody broke their collarbone there, but yeah. people, why are you jamming? Like it's a Peloton and everyone's kind of jamming on the dirt. Yeah. But I, I think I know why this happens to me and I'll tell you why after this, but okay. somebody was in front of me. And it was a flat, fast turn mm-hmm. on dirt. And I thought to myself, you're probably going too fast to this turn. So I slowed down as a weenie. Mm-hmm. But the person right in front of me just slides out and crashes. And if I wasn't, if I didn't mm-hmm. slow down, I would have been down with this person too. Yeah. Um, and I think part of the reason why this happens to me so much is I always leave, if it's like a little bit technical, I always leave this like a gap in front of me, mm-hmm. maybe like just a little bit less than a bike length mm-hmm. rather than being right on someone. And I think this is what I'm guessing. People that are more aggressive. See that as see, an opportunity. See that he's leaving a gap. Let me get in here. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then yeah. so I always get these people who are kind of overly yeah. aggressive inside right, of there man. where maybe if I would just because I don't know how I always pick these bad wheels or people crash in front of me. Yeah, that, I, maybe. that makes sense to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. A big race like that, when everyone goes out together, you know you're going to have a mix of capabilities or uh, ability <laughs> yes. levels, skill levels. <laughs> yeah. So it's a crapshoot. I mean, it's you can't just blindly trust the wheel in front of you. We got into the dirt road, at, and it was <clears throat> like a rutted out, bumpy dirt road in, in the beginning. It had a lot of bumps to it. And guys on the on Bora Hansgrohe, really good riders all over the place, were or all up in the front, were completely sketchy and all over the place, like bouncing off of other riders, um, not ready for that sort of thing. And I wanted to talk about hovering really quick. I feel like hovering is a thing that a lot of people misunderstand and they think that you genuinely do lift yourself off the saddle and that you are hovering above Mm -hmm. your saddle. 
but it's so much more about just carrying more tension through your body so that you support yourself a little bit more so that you're not supporting entirely all of your weight through that saddle or just through your handlebars, you know, that excess or that a little bit more tension that you carry can allow the bike to move underneath you. And then you're way more stable. And I noticed so many people, I mean, even like I said, I won't mention any names, but very big names up at the front. We're not doing that. And that's why one of the head guys from that, or one of the top guys from that team crashed in the beginning and a few others. And I, I even saw Peter Sagan ping pong off a few people, right? Like, um, because you couldn't see much because of the dust and everything else. So in those situations, you just really have to be in a ready position and it's not excess tension in terms of gripping your bars really hard. It's just, just in your legs and your core and you're just lifting yourself if anything, you're just relieving pressure on the saddle. That's basically it. And it makes such a huge difference. Like I was able, I was on a mountain bike, sure, but locked out going through that stuff. Still, I was able to carry through a whole lot more than I should have. If I was, wouldn't have been hovering like that. Katarina Nash, on the other hand, incredible cross racer, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as she went into that, she was going through all the biggest bumps and she was just perfectly smooth, right? I'm sure because Kabush she was, was doing fine. it. Yeah. He was I don't fine even, too. Yeah. I think Kabush probably had no hands. He was probably <laughs> like, I don't know. It's yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, uh, but it was a really fast group. It was really fun. Um, I was leading for quite a while. Leading the whole race? Yes. I, I didn't led, know that. Mm -hmm, we got into the boneyard and I was fourth into the boneyard and then I led all the way through the boneyard until the end of it. So, Oh yeah. I'm Did very, you get passed on the downhill? No, I got, I got passed after the boneyard when oh. things got steep mm -hmm. and I basically jettisoned toward the back of that front group. So I was, <laughs> I was impressed at how fast those guys went by. Um, but it was so much fun and the descents were, were obviously very fun on the mountain bike, but really cool event. I, the big, a big difference for me, I ate and I drank. And Jeez, guys. <laughs> that sounds crazy, but I did it way more than I usually do. And it was hard for me to actually drink and eat this much. Um, you know, and I, I feel like I'm better than most at doing that, but I still never drink and eat enough, I feel like. And during this race, I drank through uh, two liters of my Camelback and a bottle. Uh, so it was quite a lot for me. That's way more than I would usually drink for a four hour effort like that. But you felt great. I felt great. And I ate away. way All more right. calories, um, but I found calories that work. Science and sport gels. They don't screw up my stomach. Um, Marten is that the, the, uh, it's basically like a really high glycogen drink. And I had that in my bottle down below. Um, and then I had electrolyte tabs, uh, from science and sport too, in my pack. It was so you, great. That's a good point is you did. So both of us were trying to go fast on this mm -hmm. and you had your, uh, use way backpack in yeah. one bottle. And I see, I had five minutes at eight stations mm -hmm. and I bet you had all together you're like, saying. yeah, for my non-moving time, I'm wondering if this race would have been faster if I would have had a backpack on mm -hmm. like a use way, right, um, right. And not stop for drinks. I guess about five minutes faster. <laughs> <laughs> no, because but aerodynamics, right? Well, and no, and you got to carry like for the whole race. Then I'd be carrying an extra five pounds, right? Yeah. Until it gets yeah. out all the way. Yeah. So and there was a significant amount of climbing. There mm -hmm. was. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's an interesting question. I like, don't, and I, I don't know that we could answer that necessarily. You know, it'd be tricky. But. Also when you stop for those five minutes, that's complete rest. Yeah, sure. Right. Yep. And that get so it's not like. Oh, I would have gone five minutes faster if I would have had all the water on me and no weight penalty. Yeah. Now, now, one thing that I don't think specifically implies in my case, but I was at the pointy end of the race. We were basically Jeff Kabush and then um, one other guy. He, I can't remember his name. He's a national champ cross racer, uh, really, really fast. Jonathan Baker. That's his it. Name. Ah, oh, yeah. Those two guys were up the road. Uh, they were ahead of us. They were the first to pass me in the boneyard and then they went off the rest, which by the way, funny story, I asked Kabush how he won. And he was just like, ah, you know, I just kept it in the big ring up the final <laughs> climb. There was this final climb that was really hard. And I'm like, only you would have the strength to do that. Number one, that climb brought me to my knees, but, yeah. um, but I was with the pointy end of the group. So if I was planning on stopping at those aid stations, which they did not, then I would have missed out on the draft benefit and everything else that you got. But I honestly was already nullified with drafting because when we got to the road, and I was trying to hold on to the pace of the faster riders on cross bikes on my mountain bike. No. I was having to work so hard, even in their draft, just to hold because that increased rolling resistance. Yeah. So this is another good takeaway. I made a last minute change like always. <laughs> and I actually <laughs> on, worked out well. <laughs> well, on race <clears throat> day before race day, I'm going to change my tires twice. Mm -hmm. And I ended up, instead of doing the Thunderbirds, which are 2.3 like mountain bike tires, yep. I did the Vittoria Terreno dries, mm -hmm. which are a gravel tire, but I mounted that on my mountain bike. So it's kind of like a cross. It's a 40 C, 
I guess I guess gravel is the right word yeah, for it. Yeah, it looked like a fat tire crit mountain bike, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. really a small pattern on the tread, and then some big side knobs. Mm-hmm. And so when I was on the road, I, I didn't feel like I was riding a mountain bike. Huh. I had really great rolling resistance. Nice. Um, and then I have the Epic that has the the lockouts. Oh, I mean the the brain, so it can lock out. Mm-hmm. I forgot to turn that on the road section back. Oh, really? At the aid station. I know, and then I didn't <laughs> yeah. want to stop. Right. Um, but yeah, it's I, it's a good it's a good takeaway is that you don't you could ride a mountain bike, but you don't have to have mountain bike tires. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't think that 40C would fit yeah. on it. And I had the uh, NV. What are they called? Two five five. And five two fives five two fives yep. which have a 25 millimeter internal um width ri- yeah rim width which is wide mm. yep and it's still they, those tires were great on them they were squared off it looked like a good profile that's probably why you had even better rolling resistance with that wide tire um and then what did you ride chad um, I ended up making a last minute change also, <laughs> let these guys kind of talk me into, uh, let a certain subset of trainer road folk talk me into going out and enjoying myself more than racing it. It was Which me. sounded great. It yeah. was a combination of a lot of people. Right. But, uh, so I ended up going with my mountain bike. So hard tail, I'm, right? hard tail mountain bike with Icon 2.2s. Can I apologize to all the listeners? Because first, like, thanks <laughs> everyone who said hi to us. It was really fun meeting yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some yeah. of you, some of y'all are so fast. It's great. But yeah. Chad, someone rolls up to us <laughs> and goes... Wait, you're on a mountain bike? He goes, I switched to my cross bike because, because you said, so. you said you, it was fine. Yeah. <laughs> but And I told him what I'll tell you right now is I, I could have flipped a coin that morning and grabbed whichever bike yeah. the coin said. Totally. It, it was a win-win, lose-lose, however you want to view it. Either yeah. bike would have worked but, in its own way. So, no, I rode my SB100. I had more fun on the mountain bike. I had a full regardless. suspension mountain bike, which, by the way, I only locked out on the road. And even then, I actually kept it in pedal mode in some points on the road because it pedals well. So we had like three different bikes. But just the thing, I don't think there was a single right bike for that course. No, for sure It really not. depended on the rider. Like you said, I think you have the bike skill to be able to pull off the, the cross bike or the mountain bike. Yeah, I pre-rode the course on both bikes. So nope. and you're way faster on the mountain bike, yeah. I think. Huh. Mm, I don't but know. But he has the, in that technical section, for example, I think a lot of people couldn't have picked a cross bike because of the fact that it's more technical in that section. They would have had yeah. to have walked. But Chad has that bike skill. So... I guess uh, my point with this is if you're looking and and wondering which bike to pick for an event, something like this, rather than just weighing your decision off of a suggestion from the event or seeing what other people are doing, if you have a chance to pre-ride, that's great. But really consider, number one, your abilities, your technical abilities, or your fitness. Uh, The other thing that you need to consider is the setups on those bikes. Like, what gearing do you have? Because if you have a cross bike, you want to make sure that you have low enough gearing if there's steep, really technical climbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, or if you have a mountain bike, are you going to spin out? Yeah. You know, so you, and for you, I feel like you had the perfect bike, which was your mountain bike with those wheels. Close. Um, I feel like I would have been fastest definitely on a cross bike, but I'm just simulating Leadville with these events. So mm-hmm. I ran what I ran. If I would have, so if I would have picked bikes for you guys, I would have done a cross bike with Jonathan with the dropper. Mm-hmm. Um, I, for, with, with pretty thin tires mm-hmm. with Chad, I would have done his hardtail with the, the, um, wheels you used the, the tires I used. Yeah. Yep. And then for me, I would have done my same bike, except, uh, with, if you have a mountain bike with a 32 on front and Eagle in the back, yeah. um, you spin out at about 25 miles per hour. And this was the Boca course where there's a lot of like slight grades down yeah. where 25 is not, mm-hmm. not like you can, yeah. 25 is a hundred and something Watts. And you really want to push more. I think I still hit 47 on that descent on my mountain bike. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> Really? You hit yeah. 47? Yeah, yeah, same here. High, high 40s. Yeah. That's crazy. I wonder yeah. what I hit. Yeah, we were. I was, I was tucked trying to get some speed out of there. I'm going to use performance it, analytics to find out. It was super interesting. A uh, really cool event. I'd love to see more events like this go on. If you have, uh, they're going to have a road fondo coming up. I doubt the course will be as dynamic, but I'm sure it'll be fun because I think it's going to be around the Marin County area, but I'm not sure. We'll see where they end up putting it. But uh, regardless, it's it was a really cool event, and they're going to do it next year. So if you want to put an event down, I genuinely don't think I saw a single person cross the finish line or in that finish area without a smile. Like everyone was having a blast. That's so a good day. they had they had bacon quesadillas and margaritas at the oh, aid yes. stations. It was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So um, cool should we talk results? You did very well, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, I don't have power data because I don't have a power meter on my bike yet. They're all back ordered and waiting for one. So. How can you ride it? <laughs> without What's power. The point? Oh, you hit forty six point one. I hit forty six point seven. Oh, there we so, go. There you go. Yeah, so, yeah you were high too. 
Um, yeah. So I think I ended up somewhere around like 15th. I did four hours, I think in four or in eight minutes, something like that. So I was with the front group, but then once we got to the pavement, man, there was no way I could hold with that front group anymore. They just rode away on their cross bikes. So, uh, yeah. And then you, wh what time did you finish in? Uh, my file says 422, but it might be 428 with the uh, stops. I'm not sure. Gotcha. I had a problem. Uh, this is another takeaway. Okay. I had a problem with cramps this time. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of reasons why you might get cramps, but I personally think that I get cramps when I'm dehydrated. And I started the race where, where you had to wait the start line for a while and I had to pee. Ooh. And then for the first, like, until the boneyard, I really didn't like over an hour, I didn't drink anything because <laughs> you had to pee. I had to pee. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so at the yeah. first aid station, I stopped, but I didn't want to stop and not be in the Peloton because mm -hmm. you had a whole bunch of benefit from being in the Peloton. Totally. Um, I, I saw Jeff Kabush stop actually. Yeah. And then he just floated right back. I to think the he stopped twice. Yeah. yeah. So that's just how he rolls. But anyways, it's a takeaway is like, like empty your bladder because you don't want to, the last thing you want to do when you have to pee really bad is drink two bottles. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah. um, I was kind of playing catch up after that. And especially on the road section on the way back, um, for when it was steeper and I, I did have the gears, I, you had a limit. It was like, just maybe like sweet spot would be a limit, anything higher than that. And I would start to cramp which yeah. is really annoying because like, yeah. you don't get to express your whole it fitness. Yeah, Chad knows, right? Did you have any cramping? None at all. Oh, that's awesome. I rode a different that's race. Good. I was about 20 minutes slower than you guys. I had a margarita, I had quesadillas, I had bacon. <laughs> I, I had a good time. I had a great time, actually. You had plenty of sodium in there after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but even, you know, just, just, let's pull this race out of that mix. I've been doing long rides. I've been doing <clears throat> hard stuff without cramping. And I, I honestly have to – trace it back to my better hydration mm -hmm. I, I'm, my nutrition i'm feeding myself again so i'm recovering better after workouts but during the workouts i really feel like it's heavily influenced by my hydration and how much more dialed it's become and if you're new to the podcast last year in most of the long events we had you battled cramping last year a so lot, quite a lot yeah and uh and you're no noob you know what you're doing with with cycling you've been around yeah. for a long time so yeah, so but he didn't cramp for many years right and then you started to cramp yeah i'm not sure what the difference was there I uh, actually, maybe I, I probably did just, I don't know that I can trace it back to any one thing in that case that would yeah, take a, little, a lot more thought and a bit more review. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, I did have some cramping issues, but not too bad. I was able to, I just was kind of capped, but to be frank, I was pretty capped anyway. Um, but I actually tried a different approach with this instead of just trying to hammer it. I actually tried to pace evenly. Like, uh, not go crazy hard on the climbs, just stay consistent, not go crazy hard on the descents. Uh, never felt like I pushed it even remotely close to that, right? On the descents. Like I was just trying to be like, I was thinking on Leadville, you need to finish. And the best way to finish like that is just to be consistent and knock things off. And man, it was, I, I felt, I didn't feel worked after the race. It, it was great. So. Yeah. No, it, it says, that's another good, great takeaway is it, if you eat well and you hydrate and you don't like just destroy it at the beginning. Yeah. These longer four plus hour races mm -hmm. can be super enjoyable. Can actually oh, yeah. have fun, um, yeah. Exactly. And it's hard though to kind of, um, especially if you want to be competitive with people, like you're in a group and there gets to be the first hill yes. and they all start pulling away. And then in your brain, you have to say this, especially if you have a power meter, but you can do it by RPA too. This yeah. is too hard for me. This is a long day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it always depends. This, this one, it depends on the length of the climb too. Cause the boneyard was like a 40, 30 or 40 minute climb. Yeah. I think it's a 45 or something. If it's a two minute climb, you might push yourself over to stay with the group for the other benefits. Right. Right. But with a 40 minute climb, it's, yeah. that's just going to burn you up. You that's know, you're of, not going to Part stick. of the benefit of lining up at the back is you're not tempted into those situations. Mm. So the, the yeah. other part with lining up the back though, in which, um, Bryce Lewis, oh, it, our producer said definitely has his cons. Yeah. The, the, the level of skill on the descents can be different too. And yeah. everywhere, really, we did a lot of passing. I mean, I'm starting sure. at the back, you put a couple hundred riders in front of you. Mo uh, at least half of those riders are between you and where you're going to end up in a couple yeah. hours. So you got to get around them at some point. There were 600 And it can riders. be really taxing, like the Boneyard, for instance, a really rocky, slow-paced climb. And you have two or three riders in front of you. You have to pick bad lines. You have to balance around them. You have to hope that they're not – when they do fall, they don't fall into you. Yeah. It's, it, it gets tricky for sure. Jonathan, I have something to tell you. I'm yeah. very proud of myself, and I hope you'll be proud too. Because you've been – <laughs> been teaching me for many years i did not got, get past once on a descent nice job and i passed people on descents good they're on cross bikes but still with the i know but i'm just saying in every other race i always get passed Skills on the descents. Are coming along and, and, exactly and really just having a what i think has helped two points take away one is 
racing in um, California where the, the course, the train was not above my skill level, mm -hmm. right? It was challenging, but not above it. Mm -hmm. And then those courses were also many, many laps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got to say the same thing over and over again. Got to session it, basically. Exactly. That has totally improved it. And the second takeaway is, although my mountain bike skills have improved, I feel like on a cross bike, there's still like when we pre-rode on the cross bike, I still feel very um, afraid mm -hmm. and unstable. Right. And I'm just the point of that, like you can get really good on one bike and then another bike, you don't feel comfortable still. Yeah. I bet you if I rode more, it would come up faster. Right. But it's just a, it's That's a good an takeaway. That's point to yeah. like be patient with yourself if you feel like you're more comfortable on one bike and not mm -hmm. on another for sure. Yeah. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to mention was uh, <laughs> interesting kind of like, a, I guess, unwritten rules in this case. Like we started off the race and the pace was easy, much easier than I expected. And we were going up a steep road climb that we do in our typical weekly road race. And the pace was still easy. Uh, Dave, our filmmaker, went to the front, but he like didn't really know if he should break away. <laughs> I was toward the front at a point and didn't really know if I should try to break away. Even Kabush rolled up and he said, is this a race or are we just riding? Like what's, <laughs> what's kind of going on? <laughs> because... Sagan and his teammates were just kind of marshalling yeah. the front, you know? And Levi Leipheimer, too. And Levi, like, too. Can I yeah. ride in front of these guys? Yeah, like, what, what do we do, you know? So we actually, but uh, luckily, they ended up turning it up pretty hard to the point where basically everybody felt like, all right, gloves are off if you're turning it up this hard and, and we were able to get by them. But um, in that situation, I actually ended up almost getting dropped from the main group uh, when, or from the front group when we were going over a climb. And I had to stay within myself. I made the choice to not push as hard as I could to stick with the group. But because I knew the course, I knew that downhill was coming up and that I would be able to tuck my way back mm -hmm. up to folks and I'd be able to make it through. So a pacing thing that really could have ruined my day by trying to hold with them over that, it didn't because I knew the course. It's, it's a testament to the value of a pre-ride because mm -hmm. we got to pre-ride that. I got to pre-ride it twice. Mm -hmm. And come race day, I was so familiar with the course, so comfortable, knew when I could get away with pushing because when a recovery was, was would closely follow. Um, just how stressful about how long the mm -hmm. climb was. I knew it was going to be about 35 minutes. So I settled in for that duration. Um, th there was just a lot of, uh, just a lot of intel that benefited how I paced that course. Pete Morris so, says for like, when we did it, the cliff bar team camp, he's like, knowing the climb saves you about 5%. Oh yeah. Because you I don't agree. know, like, you know, yeah. like, just what you said, everything you just said. Yeah, totally. That's, yeah, it's a, uh, I, I never gave it as much credit as I do now. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about Leadville. It's just We're not so going to know away. that course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's frustrating. They do have that stage race that you can do beforehand, <clears throat> but I don't have time to go and do a stage race for four days of breaking Leadville into four chunks like that. And so that's going to trash you too. Yeah, it'd be pretty hard, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Segondo was awesome. Uh, we did one more race that we have takeaways that we want to share from, and that was this week we have the Geiger Hill Climb TT. And for those that you probably, if you are a trainer road user, you've heard of the workout Geiger. And really we've just utilized that name on a workout. Doesn't necessarily replicate the efforts or anything else Not that so you much. have on that. Um, but Geiger is known for being Greg LeMond's that this grade that we have by our house is it's, it's known for being Greg LeMond's kind of like a check test before, uh, he was going into grand tours or anything else. And his barometer for what sort of fitness level he, he was going to bring to the table. I believe that he was like sub 30, he was fit. And then, uh, there's rumors or myths or, or lore of him going 27 minutes. I think the fastest time is somewhere around 28 something. That's mm -hmm. from Lorenz Tendam two years ago. Yeah, fastest time on Strava. Yep. And then uh, if you're a fit person, you can break 40. Like if you're a fit cyclist, I should say, you can yeah. break 40. Um, and then anything in between there, it gets tougher and tougher. Uh, but we did not use our TT bikes, even though it only averages 5% and it's about seven and a half miles long. We didn't use our TT bikes. Uh, it's tricky with that weight trade-off, right? Like and how power, you, power too. your ability to put out power, but we did wear skin suits, um, helmets. Road I wore, arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arrow. Yep. Yep. Arrow road helmet. It was hot. So, I mean, a TT helmet probably would have been aerodynamically faster, but with the heat, who knows if that, once again, it's a good trade-off mm -hmm. there, but then I didn't use any other arrow gear. I just had a normal road bike and that was it. Yep. Did you use arrow socks or anything? Maybe? Nope. Nice. I forgot my shoe covers. I should have worn shoe covers, but I've yeah. Yeah. Because there was a headwind on certain sections it in that a bit wind. Of wind. Yeah. It's a, it, it's got minor fluctuations, I would say for a larger mountain grade, it doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. It's pretty consistent. Yeah. Um, there, you know, there's some, but, uh, just the same, the interesting thing with this. So I, I ended up doing it in 35 minutes and 23 seconds. And a goal that I had was very even pacing. Y'all have been hard on me about this going out too hard thing. 
So mountain bike facing. Yeah, <laughs> mountain bike facing. So I actually ended up having a normalized power. The power numbers weren't impressive. It was not PR power on this climb or, or anything else, but 283 normalized and 283 average. That's a first for me. That is, uh, that's some steady pacing. But that's par yeah. for the course for you, it seems, because you yeah, did the same it, thing. Yeah, but... Pacing, like I said, is one of my strengths. So yeah. it's not one of yours. So you made vast improvement over your yes. last couple of efforts. I'm yeah. just using performance analytics now. Mm. And your <laughs> first minute was um, average power 303. Mm -hmm. So that's much better than your first minute's previous ones where it's like 360. 360. Yeah. <laughs> Reined it in, yeah. Yeah, and look what happened. You know, you could maintain a steady pace over the course of it, finish as strongly as you started. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And I kind of gave it like a little bit, like when I started off, I didn't do like a really hard effort, but I made sure that I was like, just get up to speed really quick. Cause mm -hmm. I know that, and that once again, knowing the course, I know that roughly at that first little bit, if I'm sitting somewhere between 12, 13 miles an hour, that's like a, a comfortable spot to start. So I just zipped right up to that and then just tried to settle in thereafter, you know? Yeah. Minimize I, the acceleration time, basically. I did a 3741. So Jonathan beat me by two minutes and like 18 seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is fine because he should. But I also, <laughs> if you if you watch our live stream, we kind of analyze these uh, rides, mm -hmm. uh, performance analytics live stream on YouTube mm -hmm. a lot. But I, I'm the takeaway was that I think I um, got out of the saddle t too much too early and kicked it too hard. Because I got out of the saddle, I'd click down two gears mm -hmm. and I'd basically do like 380 watts for 20 seconds and then s step back in. And I had a big big explosion about 20 minutes in and. Yeah. Can we talk and, and about from a, out of the saddle? From stuff? an analytical yeah. perspective, if I were a coach looking at his his power file afterwards, trying to figure out you where, are a coach. <laughs> but I'm just saying, if I were your coach, <laughs> that's one of the things I would criticize you for. So you're wasting too much energy getting in and out of the saddle. It's not just like a got to stretch the legs. Want to want to just change my position a little bit before I settle back in. You were mm. very disruptive. You'd rise way above what you could sustain, and then you'd have to fall off a little bit, and then ease back up to where you were. Whereas if you'd stay seated, you wouldn't encounter that. Or if you'd practice that in and out of the saddle work such that you're not as disruptive, I think you would have had an even better time. It's, it's, I only got out of the saddle once and I did. And I looked down and I was like, 360 watts, sit down. Like, like I should not be doing this. Just drop a couple gears. Yeah, and I get out of the saddle you know? every couple of minutes and mm -hmm. it's, it's e pretty even keel. I mean, there's that initial two or one or two second surge and then it levels off. And then when I return to that saddle, you know, you get that little dip and then you settle back in. So mm -hmm. if you practice it and you're good at it, mm -hmm. it can actually be really beneficial. But, yeah. uh, but and that's, you can also build more efficiency when, uh, I, I shouldn't say more efficient than seated, but what I'm saying is if the, if you don't practice standing or standing climbing like that, mm. you can build a lot of efficiency by, by making sure that you, you know, put it into place in your training regularly and try to use it. Like there are certain it has riders to be that practice climb like anything else. Yep. There are yeah. certain riders that climb out of the saddle a lot and certain ones that climb in the saddle. And for me, since we're training for TT prep, I used to be an out of the saddle climber quite a lot, but I've been really focusing on just in the saddle, uh, stuff since the TT. TT is, I'm not going to be standing on in the arrow bars during the TT Ever. at all. So Chad, um, <laughs> I buried myself for a sub 39. So I got 38, <laughs> 58. <laughs> all I was shooting over was a sub 40. And then That's I saw it. that I could actually get a sub 39. So I kind of killed myself over the last 500 feet or so, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, the math, you can't argue physics. I weigh this much. My threshold's this much. Well, I can only expect so much. Let's let's talk about that. So I beat you by yeah. A this minute, is curious though. A minute and what seventeen seconds. Mm -hmm. Yep. But weight is almost the same. Like exactly like exactly the same. The same. <laughs> like this not, morning we're both like, one eighty seven. Yeah. Your bikes are probably not far off the same weight. I think His my bike weighs little, more. Probably. Yep. Agreed. We have, we have the S Works Venge Vias. It's not a particularly light bike, and also it's a sixty one. So yeah. You know it's not. But, that but the point of this is, is I put out more power. Well, I put out well, slightly more power. You put than one made. watt out. For <laughs> okay, one watt. Slightly more, but even if even if we put out the same power, <laughs> it's crazy. at the same weight. How do you go in there? Yeah. So how the, do you the, beat him? The, we both had wax changed. Mm -hmm. um, the only difference is I had the uh, Vittoria Corsa tires, and you had the GP four thousand S two or S Works yeah. turbos. No S Works turbos. Sorry, I had the turbos. Those the turbos are, are only fast. yeah, but they're only like yeah, the turbos are fast. So I think between those two tires, it's like a two watts or something, but for each one, so that could be four watts difference. Yeah. But that's not a minute. So uh, I we, wonder if your little surges out of the saddle actually added up to something. I just, I, I'm, I'm clutching at straws here. I can't but figure this out. The other thing he has, cause I mean, you guys are averaging around 12 miles an hour, but there were certain times where you guys were probably around 15 miles an hour for an extended period of time, especially in one section where it dips down a bit and you are aerodynamically optimized with your bike more than Chad's is. That could be it. I mean, maybe, but I don't really like a, a bike on a hill climb should not be a minute. 
But for well, it bikes. depends on speed, right? And if there are speedy moments and Chad has, and also you're you're narrower in your shoulders than Chad yeah. is. Chad's but I mean, more on our TT bikes, we were also like exactly the same it's CDA, CDA, right? Yeah. So it's but not like me T and you. I'm baffled. Yeah. Me and you, I would say like you're more aerodynamic but on TT, a road bike. TT position is always a little tricky. Yeah, like, TT position, I think I, I am actually closer to you. Upright, uh, not at all. Right. So, but, but there just wasn't enough wind on that course or speed for that matter to make it that. We, it seems like it would make it that. We have the same cork, like uh -huh. with the same model cork, yeah, right? Zero to prior, you zeroed prior. Yeah. I mean. um, this, the same thing happened at Boca. Mm -hmm. So what, what I think, so Boca, I could say would be aerodynamics because it was so fast. The and Merck that, style TT. That's a road race course that we did on our yep. Merck style TT as an individual time trial. But this one was uphill with the same one minute difference. Mm -hmm. And both of those, we did the same power numbers, like yeah. pretty much within what? So what I'm thinking is- Have to be more arrow. One of our power meters is reading wrong. Yeah. That's what I'm, that's, I think it makes the most sense because we did the two different courses. Yeah. Um, Cause how it wouldn't- you, And how do you solve that? So I, I'm gonna put on, what we need to do is put on a third power meter um, and see what the differences are. I think I'm gonna use Garmin vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some extra shoes and they have look cleats. I should put those on. I can do the same, yeah. Oh, well, I can just ride your bike too. As I think what we should do is right around 300 because what, what people don't know too is the slope could be different. So at 200 watts, they could be exactly mm -hmm. the same, yeah. but at 300, it could be different. Ride it at maybe 200 for a couple of minutes mm -hmm. and then ride it at 300 and see what the difference is. If there is any yeah, between it'll, each it'll bike. It'll allow us to at least eliminate this one variable. So we can say yeah. definitively, no, the power meters are totally reading correctly. Then, you, then I would look at like bearings and stuff. Like I don't even mechanical look at that efficiency stuff. loss. Just, yep. Because really, I don't think that the arrow drag on that. Which, well, let, let's you, assume that they're reading close to a correct. I do want to shine a light one more time on the fact that I'm operating at a higher percentage of my FTP than Nate is. True story. There so, we go. But I'm <laughs> faster. I'm, I'm, that is Chad's just brushing just, his shoulder off. Just over plain there. unfair. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you, the bearing shouldn't affect anything because you guys have the same. I mean, unless, I, unless the wheels are in different condition, but you basically have the same wheels on. Well, I was thinking maybe like so. in its bottom bracket, he has something that's uh, malfunctioning. You Something know, but that's disintegrating. But he's still putting, jangle, but that, chain. that shouldn't mm -hmm. affect anything if he's pushing into the bottom bracket and he's putting out wattage. The wattage get measured before that. So if there's, uh -huh. if there is drag in so, there, that, I mean, we're going to go total detective if we have to, we got to yeah. figure this out. Right? <laughs> that's exactly. I like kind of want to ride your bike up it now. Like try to get like a big seat post on it. We could switch that, bikes. Yeah, funny. we could. That'd be interesting. That'd yeah. look hilarious. We could put the, the saddle bike. down on yours. Just do a, one of our Wednesday team. Train or road rides on yeah. each other's bikes. Yeah, <laughs> and do like to see what the wattage is up there. Chad's gonna be sitting on the top two over there. <laughs> no, I think he yeah. could fit if because by saddle, there's a lot of seat posts that he could go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true story. Make it work. We're close enough. So, anyways, hill climb TTs. I think that a lot of it. Ha the main takeaway that I have is efficiency, and a lot of that goes into how you pace it. Uh, it goes into how you're expending energy. Um, Chad's a very smooth rider, and when I was behind you, you just you weren't moving around a lot. And I passed plenty of folks that were tossing and turning and really expressing to me with their body it's movement wasteful. how hard the effort was, yeah. right? Yeah. Say that again, um, Chad. It's wasteful. It, that's energy that's not driving the bike forward, so why spend it? You mentioned this a lot in, in, uh, in the workout text, and mm -hmm. I don't do this, but I need to do this more is to relax my upper body. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when it gets hard for some reason, I just have to tense up my shoulders yeah. and my hands, and that's just extra energy. Well, yeah, not only does it affect your handling and, and increases fatigue, but that's muscle contraction. So that, that, that requires energy. That requires you know carbohydrate, fat, whatever, stuff that you should be saving for later using to actually pedal the bike. Yeah. It's like being at the massage therapist when they're really deep and they're like, you got to relax, <laughs> totally. but it hurts, yep. but you got to relax. You just got to do it. <laughs> it's so hard to do that during... Um, like a hill climber TT, I, but yeah, it's but important. I tell you, you can you can learn to capture that under any any level of stress. Totally. I mean, say for maybe a sprint, but, but yeah, that'd be the only exception. Yeah, I don't think a sprint you want to, right? You want yeah. to be no, you fully want to be as tense as possible so yeah. that your body's locked in, so that those legs just drive the pedals. Same thing, uh, mountain biking downhill. Descending. I'm better. Of, I was just gonna say that I'm so mm -hmm. much better now at being relaxed upper body, and the bike just moves, yeah. but I don't move. It's, it's like amazing. It's, right? Yeah, you know, it, like it's <laughs> it's really fun. It's so good. Your bike can hit things, and it doesn't throw you all over. The yeah, place. yeah. Rather than when you're tense, and just we talked about before, because when when I wish uh, when you were talking about um, hovering, yeah. I was like, why didn't you say this two weeks ago? Because on the cross bike, <laughs> each one of those bumps, You're I would literally get everywhere. kicked forward, like yeah. in front of my handlebars. Yep. 
Um, but you can't hover the whole time. So sometimes those do catch you unawares. You're totally. sitting on the saddle. It's yeah. fully weighted. And one of those knocks you up off the saddle. But it's, it's every not, time. It doesn't mean you're yeah. a bad bike handler. <laughs> what I was, yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It happens at times. And if you hovered the whole time, it would be wasteful. Uh, like yeah. you, you hover strategically, like, you know. So. You, want, you want to talk about cramps, try hovering for an hour. See oh, how yeah. that goes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's basically what, uh, what riding and some technical East Coast style terrain will do. Mm. So that's what it, what it requires. So. Uh, so anyways, yeah, that was my main takeaway from the TT. Anything else that you guys have, like an, a hill climb TT, the advice you would give somebody if they were going to do a hill climb TT? Same advice I give them on a flat TTs. Don't go out too hard. Mm. Yeah, and that- Because it punishes you perhaps even more. Yeah, it really does. It, it, it probably carries more weight on a climb because there's no really backing off without just hemorrhaging speed. Yeah. So you can't just kind of on a flat TT, you could ease up a little bit, keep most of your speed, recover and then settle back in. Whereas mm. on a climb, you let up a little bit, you'll lose a lot more speed yep. comparatively. The other point Relatively. that I want to say, and I don't think this is why I beat you by a minute, especially because we had all, like the same equipment besides the bike, mm. is that on it was a really windy day. And what people don't think about enough are aerodynamics. Is if you're going 15 miles per hour up a hill and you get a 15 mile per hour headwind, which is not that much. You're going 30 miles an hour. Yeah, th your drag is 30 miles per hour. And yeah. think like, if I'm gonna tell you you're gonna do a TT at 30 miles per hour, you're gonna be totally aero optimized. Sure. Yep. Even with like 10 miles per hour and a 10 mile, you know, 10 and 10, yeah. that's 20 miles per hour. Even exactly. if that, if you're doing an Ironman, you're like, you're putting on shoe covers, you're doing everything. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things that a light bike always feels faster or lighter stuff, but the aerodynamics really, really help. Yeah. Oh, they totally do. Yeah, even on a hill climb. Yeah. Yep. But I don't think my bike was a minute over your bike. That would be a lot. That would seem like a lot. And just to beat even this for dead like horse, the, yeah. <laughs> on the Merck's TT, it was also exactly a minute. So it wouldn't make sense for it to be the same minute. Because it was a 35 minute effort versus like a high 40 minute effort. Well, and one was, uh, the average speed was, was way 24 higher. or something or 25 yep. and the other one was 12. So yep. it wouldn't make sense for them to be the same. Yep. Mm -hmm. It would make sense if we had the same aerodynamics actually, if the power meter was different to be, that would make perfect sense. So yeah. if, yeah. Are we, if we have a 10 watt difference, I would say there you go, it makes perfect sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, Interesting well, stuff. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, with that, let's get into some questions. Uh, this one is from Mike. He says, hello, everyone. First off, I wanted to say thank you for making a great product. You're welcome, Mike. Thanks for using it. He says, I finished last season with an FTP of about 220 watts. And after going through pneumonia at the end of the year, I got back to it with sweet spot base mid volume one and two. My FTP increased to 250 watts and is now sitting around 260 and for reference uh, here, he weighs about 157 pounds and six foot one. So he's probably somewhere around, oh man, I don't know how many kilos. You do math. Mid seventies or so. I don't know. Good job, Mike. It could be off. So yeah, good job, man. That's, uh, a, way big, to go. that's a really like really 40 watt increase. That's huge. That's huge. That's uh, he says, my question comes in with the build phase. I started your general build plan, preparing myself for my A road race in this year in July, but I also have a local Tuesday and Wednesday night crit series, which I have been racing. And just so that people know, we always split our training into three phases, base, build, and specialty. And ideally you work through all of them and finish so that your specialty finishes on that A race that he's talking about. That's like your top priority race. These usually in talking about those Tuesday and Wednesday night crit series races that he's also doing, he says, these usually give me around 50 TSS each with an IF and that's an intensity factor close to 1.0. Uh, can you explain roughly, Chad, what IF of one means uh, for folks? Like, a, Yeah, an intensity factor of 1.0 assumes that for one hour you operated at your functional threshold power. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those are normalized hard. power matches your FTP. It so is. for this, for him to get 50 TSS, that means it's a 30-minute race that he operated his normalized power at his FTP. That's, that's a hard effort. Um, that kind of sounds like what we did, actually. Yeah, that's so, what we've been doing. Yep. He says, the weather has been getting nicer, so I've been riding outdoors more in an effort to add higher TSS, that's training stress, rides to my week while vaguely trying to adhere to the general build plan. I noticed some of my 90-minute rides show an IF of higher than 1, 1 1.0, like we said, usually around 1.03. My normalized power is also a little higher than my FTP, sometimes around 268 watts. And keep in mind, he said he was at 260 watts. So does this mean that my FTP is set too low? If so, is there a way to estimate my FTP using intensity factor, time, normalized power, uh, such as how training stress is calculated? He says, I could do a ramp test again, but fear the lack of structure lately will affect my indoor ability to ride at the, and he says in quotes, new threshold and VO2 max for relatively long periods of time. Thanks again for all the works you got, work you guys do. Jeez, where do we start with this? <laughs> I think that probably the best spot, uh, best spot to start is, um, we'll get to the testing maybe a little bit later. Uh -huh. 
but normalized power and maybe understanding yeah, so, how that works. So f- first know that normalized power isn't, isn't dead even. I mean, it's, it's not always perfectly accurate. Yeah. So, so when we're talking differences between two, three, four percent, up to 5%, according to Dr. Coggin himself, he sees it accurate within about a 5% range. Which can be quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so his own algorithm, and he gives it a plus or minus 5%. So always take these small differences with a grain of salt. It m- might not be meaningful at all. Mm-hmm. Um, there are things called NP busters where you can exceed that 100 five percent limit but mm-hmm. it still doesn't mean your FTP has come up or that that's a that's a good barometer for where your FTP is what would be an example of that we, we have a, actually a ton of them and these are from dr. Coggin himself what would the race be like though like to give me an idea like it's not it's, it's not gonna be an even pace it's race. typically gonna favor or include a lot of anaerobic activity so, so that, that's how you skew it yep. basically that it kind of it kind of comes down to that gotcha. and all the MP busters got like I don't know 10 or 12 of them staring me in the face right here. Mm-hmm. They're all done at 134%, 203%, 100 and lowest one is 109% for mm. nine minutes at a time. Mm. So you really have to be able to go above and beyond what your current threshold is. And it, it will be very evident that it's time to reassess. I've improved my FTP. Yeah. It's in that 109%, for example, that would be six, 109% intervals in an hour, in an hour at threshold, and then you're dropping down to 40% FTP in between those. Yeah, so we're talking about 54 minutes at 109%. If you can do that, your FTP is not accurate. Right. It's, 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 or you've just got this amazing anaerobic contribution that, yep. you know, bus, this, F, bus MP. Normally you would see this, um, the classic one is crits. Mm-hmm. Totally. So, so this, the Pete Morris ones, one, that's a good spot. he is very anaerobic too, mm-hmm. where maybe when he gets that normalized power, sorry, Pete, but if he gets normalized power of mm-hmm. 400, Four hundred um, higher than for that. a solid hour. For a solid hour yeah. doesn't but if, necessarily mean his FTP is at four hundred. Yeah, but if we sit him on a hill climb, he probably can't hit four hundred for right. an hour. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Even at sea level, it's something that, that I've even seen in some mountain bike races. It's rare, but you can see it in those cases. The the the, t- the tough thing about getting an NP buster on a mountain bike is usually you just have more coast time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you have a lot of it uh, just because of the nature of the sport. And cyclocross is kind of the same way. It's it's yeah. tougher to see them, but not impossible. In fact, even courses like uh, Cross Vegas, uh, God rest its soul, so to speak, yeah. that that course <laughs> had that one was Rip. just like Velcro. So you, your off was never really off. Yeah. So you can see them in a, in a handful of it's, different it's, arenas. It's most common when you have the wild swings in, in power output. Mm-hmm. When you go from really high down to really low, down to you know coasting perhaps. But in his case, if he's doing ninety minutes higher than an IF intensity factor of one. Yeah. So so that's I don't I don't have actual numbers on that. I can't say that when you can do 90 minutes at this IF, this, it's, t- it's time to probably reassess. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't have that, unfortunately. But you can say if you're consistently outperforming your FTP for durations longer than an hour, your fitness is probably improved. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say that 90 minutes at an IF higher than one, you, yep. it's time to reassess. Safely. I, time I to feel, reassess. I feel good about that for recommendation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and really th- this kind of comes back to, you can feel things out and kind of estimate roughly where you are. And mm-hmm. it sounds like you're kind of on that way, Mike, like you're, you're questioning, right? Which is, hmm, maybe I am fitter than I think or fitter than that number would indicate, right? Yep. And it's, you know, for us, it's always, we were talking about this recently when we did, uh, we've been doing some, we've been doing ramp tests and, and checking out and seeing where we're at with our fitness. And I was able to predict my FTP in three different ramp tests. I was able to predict it within three watts same on here. each one. And it's in Chad was in the same boat. Nate, I don't know if you were in the same boat there on that. It's, it's Mine amazing. Mine was lower. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I think it was accurate afterwards because right. of the, the, uh, the, intensity of the workouts. Right. Isn't it amazing though? Like how you spend enough time training with that and you become really familiar with it and you can estimate really well, Yeah. you know, um, a lot of things, not just your FTP. Yeah. That said, I still feel like there's something to be said for assessment. And that kind of takes us to the ramp test because there's also something for guessing that, but then knowing exactly where it is. YouTube bros are probably some of the most experienced people listening on this podcast. I mean, you know what I mean? You're not, um, you're like not, that's you work people, at a power training company and you right. do so this do. all day Most long, of my all day it takes place. Yeah. There's yeah, probably training. some other people listening that are oh, smarter yeah. than all there are yeah, oh, yeah, because totally. they email us and they tell us yeah. <laughs> all the mistakes we make. Here's what you got wrong. <laughs> but it's, and yeah, to your point, like, uh, you gotta exactly. be experienced. 
and and it comes with time. Uh, but you can build that up and, and be familiar for it. Use it as like a cue. But I don't think that the the idea should be that let's say you have really accurate uh, ability to estimate where you're at without doing an actual assessment or anything else and that replaces assessment. I don't think that's the goal. I, I actually think, especially with something like the ramp test that we have now, which we'll be in, we'll have more information on in the next couple of weeks, but uh, the ramp test it really isn't that difficult to do. Doesn't throw on a whole lot of training stress. It's extremely hard at the it's moment. It's not, but we're, but we're not encouraging you to, te- to, to over assess. We don't want you to test again yeah. and again and again, do it on a weekly yeah. basis because you sense something has improved. There's yeah. nothing wrong with nudging things up in the midst For of sure. a workout. Totally. If you feel like, you know, I, this is under challenging me. I know I can do more. I know I've gotten fitter. Push yourself a bit. You'll, you'll know it. And, and, yep. and the, the outcome is ideally will be what we're always aiming for, which is improved performance. So mm-hmm. if you're getting faster, it doesn't matter what your FTP is or what percentage of it you're, 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 um, uh, trying to, you're agonizing over setting it at, or should I test again? If you're yeah. getting faster, you're getting, you're doing it right. You're getting it right. So uh, Mike, since you are not sure, and you think it might be too low, um, I would just do the, the ramp test. And for those who aren't aware, it's, sounds like um, it's time too. Yeah. It's still in beta. It's actually in your app right now. If you updated it, there's a workout called ramp test and we'll walk you through it again. As John said, we'll give you more information soon with the whole marketing push, but Mike, I would just reassess. Yeah. And you, you said, Mike, you were worried that the, the decrease in consistency with your training might affect it. It totally might. But remember that the important thing is to be training where you should be training. Yeah, so it's, exactly. it's not like you should be. Like we, we tie our ego directly to that number and oh, when yes. it drops, you know, it's hard, but at the same time, you're going to be getting the best training. We're using that number to help us to get the most out of our workouts. It's yep. not it's, that, that, that number is only so important. And don't say, well, I, I just need to do some workouts before I can test yeah. because, because, you know, I got to <laughs> yeah, get fit yeah. before I can yeah. test. That's a common thing totally. that Chad said for years. Yeah. You don't need to, what is it? You don't need to, what's your always thing you say? You don't need to be fit to start training or you don't need to work out to start working out yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah, like that so, yeah, something yeah. along those lines yeah. yeah the two things i just want to hit home with the ramp test it's not as it even though it's a shorter thing than the traditional like two by eight or one by 20 test you still need to make sure that you know you're not completely fatigued coming into the thing uh mm-hmm. it's going to show itself because it's it's a hard effort man uh in some respects i almost find this one like uh, maybe mentally tougher. I don't know, but pacing for a really long time is also mentally tough. It's yeah. different. My consolation with the with the ramp test is that the pain only lasts for a few minutes, as <laughs> exactly. opposed to you know, yeah. several. But many. you need to be able to go all out. Oh, Absolutely, yeah. you got to yep. empty that tank. Bury yourself. Yep. Like, just yeah. like a, uh, I, I consider it like a, a three minute hill climb with your friends. That's yeah. the similar pain where you start and like we're going all out on this. Yes. that's the, how deep you need yeah. to go. And you get to the top and it's like two pedal strokes before you explode and that's it. Yep. Yeah. Flop it, over your bike. I yeah. can't. Like, I can't. Move coasting is hard afterwards. <laughs> yes. That's why we're on the trainer. <laughs> yeah, and then. Um, but the, then, uh, sorry. Then and also please. after about thirty seconds, mm-hmm. you're like, I'm fine. <laughs> I, can, right? I can go yeah. back. Yeah, maybe about three minutes or so. I felt pretty worked after the last one. <laughs> um, but and then we usually recommend testing. You know, every four to six weeks. Like Chad said, you don't need to test every week. Uh, you no, know, you don't need to stay that on top of it. There's just not a lot of benefit, and fitness doesn't matter manifest that quickly either. So, yeah. so give yourself time to actually improve your fitness. On top of that, yeah. a lot of these workouts, if you're following a training plan are scaled based on the fact that you're going to use the same FTP mm-hmm. from, you know, four, four to six weeks at a time, the workouts already have their own enhancements that make them more demanding. So if you're on top of it, adjusting your threshold up every week and getting a tougher version of the workout you did last week, that's <laughs> a, it's a double whammy. It's you yeah. can not put recommended in hole pretty easily sure. that way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next one is from David. He says, Hey, Nate, Chad, and Jonathan last week, Jonathan mentioned he had started riding a Yeti SB 100 and you guys touched a little on mountain bike parts, especially wheels due to the upcoming dirt Fondo. From what I can tell the SB 100 runs 29 er wheels. And I was hoping you could all explain what size mountain bike wheels you run and why I'm looking at getting a new mountain bike. And currently I'm on a hardtail 29 er. I don't have good enough access to try 27 and a half or 29 plus or 27 and a half plus. And I was interested in your thoughts. I largely do marathon and three to six hour enduro style races with some technical parts and climbing, but nothing too gnarly. And my feeling is 29 inch rims with 2.2 to 2.4 tires is still a good go-to for this style of riding. Thanks in advance. Um, This one's definitely in my wheelhouse. This is very your wheelhouse. We're (laughs) going to sit back and drink our coffee. But something, Chad, you, you brought something up and it perplexed me and I'd never thought of it. It's been a point of confusion for a long time. And I basically just got down to more confusion or just a total lack of logic, but basically, so, so 29 inch wheels on mountain bikes, they're obviously larger diameter. And when you're talking about 29 inch wheels, you're actually talking about the, the rim bed. That's the diameter you're talking about. You're not talking about the, the 
upper edges of the walls of the rim. You're not talking about the interior mm-hmm. diameter of it. You're talking about the rim bed, right? That's 29, 29 inches is what they're referring that to. 27 and a half inches, no, it's the same thing, just a little smaller, right? 26 is like the traditional mountain bike wheel size, but then 29 came out and there was backlash. So then marketers said, well, how about we go in between and we do 27 <laughs> yeah. and a half. That's the real answer, <laughs> <to be> honest, <laughs> right? So, um, and 26 is pretty much gone and that's what it is. So, and they thought, why don't we sell you another bike? <laughs> exactly right. And then we can sell more do. tires and more wheels and yep. everything else and standards all over the place. So uh, here's the interesting thing. Uh, you know, 27 and a half inches is much closer to it's in fact, I think it's only two or three millimeters off of 700 millimeters. Yeah. Right. So, um, so the interesting thing about this is that most road wheels that we use are called 700 C tires or wheels, right? 700 C is what you use on a road bike and you can take a 29 or wheel or a 700 C tire and they're interchangeable as long as the internal widths match. That's what I did on my cross bike. So I had the, and mm-hmm. that kind of blue Chad's mine is I had the, the cross bike mm-hmm. tire and I put it on a mountain bike, yes. which seems like it shouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. So here's the interesting thing though. So 700, we're talking a really old wheel design. We're talking like we're over a hundred years, right? There was 700 A, B, C, and D. C is the one that stuck. A, B, C, and D were actually all referring to, they wanted 700 to be the outer diameter of the tire originally. Then A, B, C, and D referred to the inner diameter of the actual rim bed. So they wanted to keep the tire the same size, no matter what yeah. rim you were on, but then have different ones. Well, it all stuck with 700 C for some reason. That was the Come one on. we all settled on. So when we settle on 700 C, you would think that there would be some sort of logic or anything else, but it actually doesn't equal 700 millimeters at all. It's just like a two by four. If you've ever measured a two by four, it isn't a two by four. It's a one and a half, and a half by, by three, three and a half, half yeah. right? But we call it a two by what? four. Yeah. yeah. You guys yeah. are blowing my mind <laughs> today when they mill the wood. Yeah. Yeah. What else are lies? I <laughs> <laughs> right. So 700 C does not equal it's, it's not, it doesn't actually have any numerical, uh, you know, uh, significance really. It's just 700 C equals 29. Yeah. And then if you have a 27 and a half inch wheel that equals 650 B. So once again, the B has nothing to do other than the fact that it was a different assignation at the time with a numerical or with a letter that they put on the end, it indicated a different diameter. Mm-hmm. But we've stuck with 700 C and 650 B and 700 C equals 29, 650 B equals 27 and a half. They need like a standard like group where they all get together <laughs> and they say, this is what we're going to do. It's called standards. I That's know. it. We yeah. just need to be like, held to a certain it's level so, of standard. It's so confusing, right? It doesn't, yeah, it, it should be more clear. It's just, more, I we bet just they would, the metric system. I so bet you yeah. they would sell even more if it was all less, it was less confusing because, totally. um, and totally. they wouldn't have to have so much money in inventory with all these parts. The, I, the, the argument against, or for standards is imagine if every plug in your house was a little different or everything that plugged into plugs was different. Like oh, there's a standard, so frustrating. you get it when you travel to inter- different countries, but yep. imagine if that was every plug in every device. Yes. You had to have <laughs> Welcome adapter. to a bicycle. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to a bicycle. It's so frustrating. Okay, so, so, so then what is the benefit then of running 29s, 29 inch wheels over yeah. 26s? Um, so a, a lot of it does come down to like personal preference. And in this case, we'll basically compare 27 and a half to 29, just because those are kind of the, the only ones that really exist anymore. 26 is on some downhill bikes and then obviously like kids bikes or something, but um, so a lot of it comes down to personal preference and what you would, if you're the type of person that prefers a more stable bicycle that has a more controlled feeling, then you would prefer a 29. So I came from the motocross side of things. And as a result, I'm used to a ton of inertia, right? Like in really heavy tires, heavy wheels, everything else. So I love a 29 feel and I can't stand a 27 and a half or, or a 26. 27 How does that and a half feel? Is okay. How does 27 and a half feel? More nervous, but much more maneuverable to some folks is how they would say. It. I mm. say nervous, another person says maneuverable, right? So it comes down to preference. Um, a benefit that 29 has is that you get a bigger contact patch on the ground. So since the tire is, uh, the diameter is bigger, that circle is bigger, it's actually more of that tire is gonna be on the ground. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually does increase your traction quite a lot on the tire. Um, when 29ers first came out, they were really poorly implemented. And basically what they did is they had a 26 inch bike and they just threw big wheels on it and it made it handle poorly because you were sitting way up in the, um, in the air, bike had a really high center of gravity, it wasn't optimized for it. Um, and now if you can visualize with me, basically 29 inch wheel bikes have changed so that instead of the bike being on top of the wheels, the bike almost fits in between the wheels. So they've kind of lowered everything down there. And when you do that, you actually get a bike that's, that's more stable, but it's not excessive. 
So 29 by inch bikes, if you haven't tried them recently, they're very maneuverable. If you haven't tried 27 and a half inch bikes, you might be surprised to find that they're maneuverable, but also way less sketchy than a 26. Um, I've ridden some 27 and a half inch bikes and swore they were a 29er. And a lot of that has to do with where you're sitting in relation to the wheels. Mm -hmm. So there isn't really a, an easy answer to say, but I can say that I certainly do prefer riding a 29. It carries a little more momentum, doesn't seem to get hung up quite as much, mm -hmm. feels so a little more stable. For David, if he's into an enduro style, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, you, the argument, you could go either way. You totally could. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really do. Like, I, I think I prefer the 29. You mentioned the plus size things, which in that case, we're just talking about how wide the tire is. And man, like plus size tires make you feel like a hero. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Like it, they're not as fast going uphill and you do feel the, the sluggishness because they weigh a lot. The tires do, uh, the rims weigh a bit more too, but man, it feels so cool. You're just glued to the ground coming down. So the, um, it's almost like a, a, sorry, but it's almost like a handling thing. Like if you feel like handling, uh, is, is a weakness of yours, I would go and, and let's say handling, like you feel nervous and unstable. I would say a 29 might help a bit. And then if you want to go for plus tires, that could help too. But if you feel like you're very skilled at handling and you like to really like, um, and you like a bike that feels very quick and maneuverable, you've been riding bikes for a long time and you're used to that traditional mountain bike feel, you're probably going to like 27.5 more. Isn't the 29 too, like when it's, when it's because it's a bigger circle mm -hmm. that when you roll over like rocks and roots, mm -hmm. it's less, you get less deflection. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, the better rollover is usually yeah. what they call that. Um, and there, I think a lot of that comes down even more so to like the head tube angle of the bike. It's, it's all a mess that kind of affects itself. Right. But if you have, uh, you'll see bikes are getting more and more slack, meaning that front wheels getting further and further in front of you on the bicycle. Mm -hmm. And that I think helps roll over more than anything. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's basically the, the difference is if you like a stable bike, a really like a more predictable one, then I'd say 29 is probably where you're at. If you like a, something flickable, then 27 and a half. And if you want to run road tires on your mountain bike, yeah, it's easy. All you have to do is just run 700 C tires on your 29 inch wheels. So, <laughs> and hope that the spacing lines up. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, let's go into Jacob's question. He says, for my pain cave, I've purchased the fan that you have recommended a couple of times, plus the wireless remote controlled plug-in so that I can turn my fan on and off without getting off the bike. Good recommendations. I can already hear people sending in uh, emails. Questions. About what like, fan? Yeah. What yeah, fan? Yeah. The Lasco performance series fans are the really good ones. They look like little, like kind of like a uh, a little pod that turbine just sits on the ground. Yeah, yeah, turbine. Turbine. Yep. Perfect. Um, there's a gray one that we have and it has kind of like a wider vent and it's really strong. There's also a like yellowish orangish one that uh, Keegan Swenson, the pro XC racer got and his, and it's basically the same, but it has like a taller beam of air. So, hmm. which, you know, you're kind of a tall shape when you're on a bike. Lasco also. A Lasco performance series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just slightly different shaped. So, and a little more compact, but uh, they're really effective. And then what's the remote plug-in thing you guys have? Yeah, it's a user sent it in mm -hmm. and you go on Amazon, they're like eight bucks. I don't know what they're called, but they're for like Christmas lights or something. Okay. Where it's a little wireless remote and it's so nice because I leave it on my- It's uh, like a key fob. Yep. Oh, wow. That's small, huh? Mm -hmm. I leave it on the kicker desk mm -hmm. and then when the Wahoo kicker desk or Wahoo desk, that's what it's called. Uh, you warm up and then I turn it on and then during the cool down, actually I leave it on during the cool down, but it's just nice to be able to easily turn on and off without getting on and off your bike. It's really nice. Nice. Um, yeah, you can go, there's a bunch of different options on Amazon. I just looked up. They're um, all cheap. Don't, yeah. pay, don't pay more than 10 bucks. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he says, do you guys have any good recommendations for earbuds? I became a new dad over the winter and now try to cram 30 minute rides <sighs> in first thing in the morning or over lunch. And I can't have blaring music anymore. I have a cheap pair of earbuds off Amazon, but oftentimes sweat kills them mid ride. I also would argue that many yeah, times you have to sound horrible too. Yeah. You turn up the, you turn up the volume so much with those just things that then blast just your hurts your ears. Yeah. Uh, so he says, uh, I'm not a fan of wireless headphones because I don't want to worry about them being charged all the time. So do you have any suggestions? Thanks in advance. Uh, so I want to address the wireless thing first. I, so I, love wireless headphones for training. It is so nice not mm -hmm. having a cord dangling around. 
Yeah, how many times have you, like, knocked your cord out yes. on your hands? Like, a bazillion. I, in fact, I actually destroyed a pair of headphones once because I had them plugged into my phone, and then when I went to get a drink, I haphazardly dropped the bottle down. The headphones went down. Oh, they yeah. got wrapped into my chain, and they just destroyed. And I was like, no. <laughs> if you've got in earbuds and they're, they're a nice snug fit, and you mm. catch that cable, it hurts. It can hurt, It's too. no joke. It, it's painful. Yeah, so the way that I do it, uh, just a tip, and we're going to get into the, the Bose ones that – or, sorry, the, the Jaybirds that Chad and I use uh, – these little Jaybird Freedoms, mm -hmm. uh, those F5. ones, yeah, the F5, they have like a little charging block that comes with it that you just like clamp on. And I keep that charging block always plugged in on my computer and my headphones, just when I'm done with them, they go back in the same spot. I never have to worry about it. And they last yeah. for eight hours. Mm -hmm. So it's like plenty of time. Mm -hmm. I've had to experiment with the actual fittings that go on the earbuds. So I've got my, my old go-to were these Klipsch headphones because they just nested so nicely, but it was less about the headphones and more about the little rubber fittings that went on the end of them. Mm -hmm. So I take those fittings, put them on the Jaybirds and everything's just damn near perfect. Something I want to say that I don't think people consider enough is that when you have wind coming at you and you have an earbud that's like big and sticks out, it causes a lot of wind noise. And then you end up turning the volume up even more mm -hmm. and you don't need to have the volume that high. So these ones, the Freedoms, the reason I like them over their more expensive ones from Jaybird is the fact that they like, they're really small. They're mm -hmm. kind of shaped like Klipsch earbuds that are very like, almost like just like a little pin that goes in your ear and they sit in there and then they don't catch a lot of wind. You'll know you have most. a good fit if everything outside gets a little quieter and everything inside, like in your head, when you clear your throat, gets a little louder. Mm -hmm. yep. That's a good tip. Yep, I really like those ones. So those are the ones that, that I use. What about you, Nate? I use the Bose Quiet Control 30. They're Ooh. like in-ear ones. And the reason I got those is I've tried a whole bunch, tried the Jaybirds. Um, I don't even know. I spent yeah, too the, much money on headphones. AirPods <laughs> or Apple Pods or whatever. Those, those don't see. Those don't have enough. They don't what, seal any they noise don't at yeah. all. So I want the boys Ugh. ones, uh, the Bose ones. I got these because I want a noise canceling. Mm. Yeah. Because then with the fan and stuff and the the trainer noise, it knocks out so much of that. And they don't have to turn the volume up as high. Yep, exactly. And my thinking is like, I think yours too. I used to, so I used to play in a, or like a rock band, mm -hmm. and I already have a little bit worse hearing. Tinnitus. Yeah, I don't want to live. I don't want to have. I want to have, I don't want hearing aids yeah, yeah. for as long as I can. Yeah. So they're 300 bucks. Wow. So they're expensive. They're yeah. like really, like that's three years of Trina Road. Right. That's a lot of money. <laughs> that is. Um, just for headphones. Yeah. But again, it's a, it's a cost benefit thing and I am on this bike Mm -hmm. All the time. Hey, well, the, the Jaybirds are super affordable. Yeah, by I comparison, they're, they're like eighty bucks. Yeah, I think they're yeah, and I've even seen them like on closeout sites recently for I think around sixty. So yeah, I think they cheap. retail for one hundred and fifty or something. Which I don't even know why they post those prices because they're nonsense. <laughs> yeah, but you know, Amazon will sell it to you for eighty dollars. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're really good. Um, ideally, and and I will say this, even though it's loud. There is a difference though between having earbuds and then, like you said, blasting music loud. In this case, like having a really good sound system. Yeah, it's visceral. Your whole body <laughs> feels it, not just your head. I think yeah. it's like five watts. <laughs> you, I, you, I, right? I agree. Oh, totally. There's Amazing. there's like the the having loud music in my headphones, mm -hmm. and then there's like a, a subwoofer. Oh, yeah. totally. when, when the bass rumbles your guts, I mean that's worth something. <laughs> oh, that yeah. makes you go guts. faster. Totally. Yeah. Now you've been using the HomePod. Well, I got an Apple HomePod, and it's not loud enough yeah, okay. for use with the trainer. Yeah. I might try to, but I just don't. In, in defense of those simpler systems, I have a Sonos soundbar and the Ooh. subwoofer that goes with it. And they're not cheap, but that fills the space. And it's a basement space, so it's not a big space. It's pretty, uh, the ceilings are like six feet high. Okay. So it's not a, it's not a you know, synth, or a, what's the word I'm looking for? Music hall or by any stretch, but right. that works. It works really nicely. Huh. Okay, over over the all office. the noise, over over the noise of the fan, no, definitely not. <laughs> just turn it on here and just blare music. <laughs> yeah, Red Hot Chili Peppers, it's pretty loud. That would be funny. Um, we have one more question. You guys want to cover it? It should be a quick one. Then we'll mm. get to the live stream stuff. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, Judy says, hello, love the podcast and love the training plans. I've learned so much and have really noticed uh, improved endurance on my rides. I recently rode the Sierra Century 200K with 10,000 feet of climbing. Oh, and I felt great all day. That's a big day. 200K, 10,000 feet. That's a climbing day. Yeah. My question, I use a Kurt Kinetic Robe machine and want to put tubeless tires on my new road bike. But my local bike shop told me that I shouldn't run tubeless since I train on a trainer and the tire will wear out quickly and they are expensive and difficult to replace. I wonder if I should just use my old road bike and train using virtual power instead of using my new ro road bike, which has a stages power meter. 
The wheels are not interchangeable due to the new bike having no uh, having through axles. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on this? And then she also says, by the way, my FTP stayed roughly the same when I switched from virtual power to the stages power meter when I got the new bike for the. And, but she says when I got the new bike, the virtual power feels easier. So yeah, I have yeah. a suggestion. Yeah, hundred percent. Use your power meter so it's consistent between the two. Totally. You, you like absolutely have to do this. Yeah, yeah. you have and that option. Always. What you do is you get the cheapest wheel you can, and mm-hmm. you get a trainer tire. Yep. Yeah, That's totally. It. You can find cheap wheels and you can run them like that. So there's nothing wrong with running tubeless on the on the trainer in terms of I've heard people like assume that it cooks the sealant, but if that was the case, the 140 degree pavement that we ride on yeah. all the time, I think that that would cook the seal, seal or sealant mm-hmm. too. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily cook the sealant or anything else like that. But totally right, the local bike shop that says that the tires tend to be more expensive. Tubeless tires do tend to be more expensive, and also softer compounds will wear wear more quickly. Well, it depends on the the tire. Yeah. You can get now finally more tubeless tires are coming out with like a harder compound, Mm -hmm. but it's probably going to be more expensive than a standard clincher. And then it is a pain to switch out with, with tubeless sealant compared to just switching out a tube. Right. So yeah, I absolutely recommend looking for a wheel and keep in mind, this wheel can suck. You just basically has to be true and that's it. Um, and, and then if you can do that, then I think that that's definitely the, the best solution. Um, but I would, absolutely prioritize like nate said training with the same power measurement inside and outside Mm -hmm. and you can i mean you can run a regular road tire on a kirk kinetic really the one that is gonna uh eat the tire up is a compu trainer because it heats up like a bajillion degrees i keep saying bajillion but it heats up a lot (laughs) a lot um i you can i wouldn't do like chad's hundred dollar s works turbo yeah, the, tires that's the, like too much the turbos are like a one race tire they're incredible <laughs> for a race true. and after that they're flat yeah. <laughs> mine i switched out to those because they would square off so much in the so rear quick. Yeah. i'd go on a three hour ride and it would start to square yeah, yeah. but uh, it feels so good those yeah. tires like nothing corners as well as those things it's yeah. i know so but don't run them on the trainer <laughs> yeah I, I, th- that would be the one tire i wouldn't think but i mean i wouldn't i would yeah. honestly I, if i wouldn't even get it i would just run that tire on it yeah. Unless you have some really fancy tire, but maybe mm-hmm. even like a um, Schwabby uh, Pro One. Pro One I would, too. I would Those run things that. last. Yeah, I would run it on the trainer. Off. I totally it, would. Totally. And you wouldn't have to worry about it. Another one that I would say is the Specialized Roubaix tubeless. That's another one that you could run. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I did those for a while. That yep. one for sure. Yeah. Last forever. Um, I, you're not going to have problems. And I think that people overestimate the wear problems that they're going to have on a trainer if they have a good trainer, like a Kinetic. Yeah. it's You're right. So there's we're, there's two different kinds of tubeless, right? There's the super duper race ones like the uh, S-Works Turbo. tubeless, Turbos. the Vittoria Corsa. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even the Continental GP4. No, that's not tubeless. Yeah, uh, no, it's not. Unfortunately. There's the really thin ones, but then there's like other ones they make that are durable. Yep. I would totally run those all day long. That'd yeah. save you money too. Yeah. To not have to get a wheel and a cassette. No fear at all. All right, everybody. If you're joining us for the live stream, stick around and we're going to answer some of the questions that you've submitted uh, throughout the duration of this podcast. If you're joining us on the podcast, thank you so much. Remember, you can submit your questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. And we will look through those questions and talk to you all again next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, yes. everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. All Somebody said, "How good was that Giro stage?" Oh, ah, haven't seen don't it. say don't anything. You dare. Don't spoil. Still got 10k to watch. We were yelling at them because the riders were not riding fast enough to finish the stage before we went live. That's actually what our technical difficulty was. We were just watching <laughs> the, the Giro stage. <laughs> if only. Not right? true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's good. All right. Let's see here. Well, here's a good one, Jason or uh, Chad from Jason. Having completed a 100 mile ride at 0.75 IF without any issues, cramp, nutrition, etc., I've got a 300K ride coming up this weekend, 185 miles. How should I look to pace the longer ride? 0.65 IF, 0.7 IF? Uh, there is a time cutoff, so he doesn't want to be too conservative, mm-hmm. but he still wants to finish. I would just start at the lower end of that spectrum. I think that's perfect. The the 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.65, and maybe even nudge up. Or where do you say? 0. 0.65 to 0. 0.7. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a super good range. Hmm. Just start at the lower end of it, mm-hmm. and over the course of it, nudge it up to the higher end of it. And you don't yes. have to watch IF the whole time. Just just you know, gradually work a little bit harder. Whatever wattage you settle into, uh, just bring it up a bit. But if you could do that for a hundred miles, you say hundred miles or hundred k? One hundred eighty five miles is what's coming up. But what was yeah. the last one? Uh, 100 miles. Yeah. So if you can do that for 100 miles, you're, you in the, you're in the same very narrow or small ballpark. 
Yeah. You're not going to have to trim off much at all. You'll be amazed at how many people that are faster than you or more fit you will beat if you properly pace like that. Mm. Yeah. Seriously, a couple (laughs) percentage drop and and you can extend that 100 ride out to a 185 mile ride. Yeah, because they'll go too hard. They'll bonk and just go like 100 watts back. I've been in that. We saw it at this Sog and Fonda. I mean, people people attacked those early kilometers like, what are you doing? We got a five hour day out here. The, and I, I can't hammer home enough how hard it will be probably for you to hold back in the beginning. Like, but you got to make yourself do it. Just do it because it's going to pay off. It'll later. pay off. Right this that first be. hour for that last hour. The mm-hmm. only thing to say about this is it would be nice to be in a pack. It'd be, so what you have to do is right. find people of similar ability. Yes. And mm-hmm. get in that pack. And also, uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, though. It's not. It's not. It's not. Influence and convince people. Start talking to people. And let Slow them down, know. everyone. Like, <laughs> I know, like, there's That's... a certain thing, and I don't know, it's like you take a paternal tone or something like that, but when you're with them, you basically, guys, this is not an all-day pace. Like, this let's, let's be smart. Let's settle in. I guarantee you we're going to catch those people. You know, like, sell them on it. And if you do, then yeah. you'll have a group that you can actually work with. I watched five guys roll by me on the road, and mm-hmm. they said something about, chain gang, get on. I was like, no. And then as soon as we got to the climb that was, I don't know, four or five miles up from there, <laughs> passed every one of them at the same speed or at yeah, the same there, level of effort I was go. exerting earlier. Yeah. Ooh, um, somebody asked you, Nate, uh, any plans to venture back into triathlon? No. <laughs> no, no, I know. Actually, <laughs> long term, yes. Yeah. So it's a life goal. I'd love to be able to qualify for Kona and actually complete the Ironman. There. I totally think you could. I don't have any dreams of like. I just want to experience it, mm. right? Like being there so much and seeing it's it. Bucket list. It's yeah, it's a bucket list. It's got to be like during that race start. That's got to be one of the more powerful things. Like it's and and it race finish yes. like that. It's a bit magical, I gotta say. It yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, it is. For for as as cut and dry a man as you are to say something like that, I, yeah. I, I, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's magical. It really is, though. There is something to it. Man. It is. It's, There's an atmosphere, a very distinct what atmosphere. What they have to do, like uh, Courtney McFadden, that pro CX racer, she's over in Kona right now, and she can only ride the Queen K. She was told like she can only ride like flat roads. Mm. And she's rehabbing her hip right now, mm. and I sent her a picture or I sent her a message saying like that's that's like the world's worst road like it's actually really good pavement yeah and it's it's got views of an ocean the whole time but it's, it's i swear and windy oh hot my hours. gosh what they have to put up with so i would like oh. to i would like to try to come back to triathlon maybe when i'm f- in my 40 to 44 mm-hmm. but i'd like it's just so much time that it takes to be fast mm-hmm. and trainer road needs to be in a position where i can do like i can work half days for we just, I don't think you're in there. Brandon no. and Pete's is like, you should try it. Yeah, yeah. Just work half days for like totally. six months and just get really, really, really fast. And the yeah. other half yeah. day train all day long. Yeah. But, um, and it's, we're, we're still, we're not, we're not the there. ball we're isn't ahead. big enough Full to rolling, ahead. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sure like, uh, Sergi Bryn, or whatever, you can probably yeah, train yeah. all day long, right? Because yeah. Google's so big. I mean, we're not, it's oh. different scales, but just get to the yeah. point where the leadership person can set direction but not be there day to day. And that's kind of the goal of a lot of that's business Kona people. Nate. But I do like being here every day. You yeah. guys know it. I love like telling everyone what to do. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things. That's when Kona Nate will, will happen. Yeah. So, uh, Mark, uh, you asked that question. Then you also mentioned the fact that you can't put out as much power inside as you do outside. That's super common to see people struggle with that initially. Usually we find that it comes down to cooling. Uh, really you have to cool yourself, cool yourself way more than you think on the trainer. Uh, I mean, riding outside every single part of you is, is enjoying, I guess, evaporative cooling. Uh, mm-hmm. so when you're inside, you don't have air rushing over that surface to help cool that off at all. So it's, that's one of the biggest things. Uh, but then other than that, plenty of stuff, whether it's, uh, you know, your ability to, to kind of ward out the, or weed out the, the context change and just focus on the work. The fact is, if you can do it outside, you can do it inside. With proper cooling, f- you can very probably do it inside. Yep, you just have to, to bring it out, and it'll make you a stronger rider pushing through that. Jared asks, um, is there a live-in barber at the TR office? Every time I watch, I feel compelled to make an appointment for a haircut. I actually you know how much time haircut. these guys spend on their hair on podcast days? <laughs> <laughs> it's absurd. I what can, if we get a stylist that comes in? I can I can actually <laughs> I can actually say that today took no longer than five seconds. So. I'm just messing with you. Yeah, yeah there we go. Um, Jamie asks plans to sink to Wahoo. And I think what Jamie is asking is, mm-hmm. um, for performance analytics, could mm-hmm. the Wahoo head unit be an input into trainer road for performance analytics? Mm-hmm. And actually, so I'm, sometimes I say things way too early. <laughs> Just yesterday, I challenged our CTO to put on the roadmap, 
um, an API so that other people can send stuff to us um, yeah. other than like with Garmin and uh, Strava, we're using their API. But mm-hmm. I think what we need is our own API that people can register to and then they can push whatever data they want to mm-hmm. our platform. For sure. Uh, so yes, Jamie, it, it's not a trivial thing to do. The hard part is making sure that it scales really well mm-hmm. and that it's robust. It doesn't get abused, take us down, and that we have like conformity around the data and then developer documents, uh, registration process so that someone in Russia can't just send us terabytes of files and take down <laughs> our site. Yeah, um, exactly. So it, it, it gets complex, but yes, I'd like to do that. Got it. Uh, let's see. Scrolling back through. Um, Anthony says that uh, you disagree about the haircut thing. <laughs> that's you Jack. of course yeah that makes sense um man uh i guess that that more or less covers because we answered a lot of these questions are about performance analytics and we answered we've answered a lot of those no somebody asks um why in performance analytics are we not doing watts per kg records mm. and we so we've talked about either like doing it for certain bikes or Mm -hmm. certain types of races and watts per kg. I think you'll see probably watts per kg first. We needed a better way to um, keep a history of our weight. And that's Mm -hmm. what we have. We have plans to do that and stuff. But we, there's only, we we built a ton of stuff and you have to make the decision like, do you want to just keep building and building and building and never release it? Or you have to release something (laughs) and add something to it later and prioritize features. so right now, the the main driver that I think will help most people is to get a really good calendar. Mm. And that's where we have a, a team dedicated to it. And they are not, like, don't talk to them about anything else. Right. And then there's other people working on performance analytics bugs and then other improvements like this. So as long as we keep the bugs down, yep. they have more uh, bandwidth to work on future improvements on this. Yep, makes sense. Reese says, as a triathlete in Australia, I'm starting my off season. My biggest limiter is my run, and I want to do a focused training block or two on just running. But what sort of train or road plan or workout should I do or should I drop back to on the cycling front during this run training block that I'll be doing? He says, for info, this season I was doing the half distance mid plan, but I was skipping the Friday easy ride for the last 12 weeks. So if somebody's really trying to focus on their run, a triathlete, what type of cycling could they uh, do? What type of cycling or what type of running? Uh, cycling training. So basically during oh. that time when they're focusing on the running, uh, they don't want to completely d- just sure. drop the bike off. Yeah, you could just look at the tri plans and just swap out a, <clears throat> excuse me, a bike workout for a run workout. Mm-hmm. It really is that simple. You're just reprioritizing. So you know, cut something. A lot of people cut their swim down so that they don't uh, lose any if, or lose much of their cycling fitness. Mm-hmm. Um, so just trim it somewhere else and add it to the running side of things. Awesome. Um, Mark asks, and it's the local Mark, Mon- I think you say Monahan. Monahan. Okay. Sure. Um, he asks, how do you adjust weeks worth of TSS in one event, then follow up with poor legs and then another huge TSS event? So I think he's probably saying he's going to do probably Lost and Found and he did yeah. Segondo and then Carson City, where you have a huge weekend event mm-hmm. and then the next week or a week you know you have another one you don't have time to recover in between mm-hmm. uh what do you do and then you, you can get in this downward spiral yeah you just have to dial your weeks back obviously you're you're, you're getting most of your prescribed stress in a single day so it's probably going to merit additional recovery I mean, almost definitely going to merit additional recovery so more than just your monday typical off day probably tuesday as well mm-hmm. maybe tuesday is an easy ride mm-hmm. but then you know you can probably and you'll have to figure this out for yourself get back on track with maybe your late week high intensity workout and then be back on track by the subs or the following weekend yeah what about two i feel like in order to improve you need to skip like one of those events like if you don't expect to keep getting better and better and better mm-hmm. when you have just week like it's it's like the people who run marathons every weekend yeah like it's really hard to have an, to, to build up and get yeah, if faster. you're racing every weekend then uh, i'm I'd probably, in a lot of cases, recommend that you still do, uh, it would depend on Saturday, Sunday racing, but a couple days of recovery. And then if you still want to work in two days of intensity, they're going to be shorter, harder workouts. Yeah. So, so just, you know, 30, 45 minute workouts where you, you're kind of just touching up the energy system. You're not really looking to accumulate fatigue. You're not really looking to improve performance over the course of the week in between these races. You're basically just you're in a race season. You're just trying to stay fit for each of those races. And when they come mm-hmm. weekend after weekend after weekend, it's a big challenge. 
and yep. it will start to break you down. So pay it attention will. to how well you're recovering. It totally will. Yeah. It's not like a sustainable approach to take. The other thing could you do is um, you could use performance analytics. Mm -hmm. And you know, usually some of these races too, it's like six months ahead of time you plan, yep. is to kind of build up your stress so that mm -hmm. a 300 TSS ride isn't like you're doing 600 TSS weeks, mm -hmm. so one 300 TSS ride isn't going to knock you back as much, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah, so you can just take more. For sure. But that's kind of – sorry, Mark. That's – you should have trained but, but more in earlier. Anticipation, it doesn't really help. In anticipation of these longer rides or these races that we have coming up, I've been doing longer weekend rides. So throwing in you know yeah. a Sunday ride that is in the four- to six-hour range because I want to have – some familiarity with at least being on the bike that long. So if yeah. you have that luxury, if you can you know, de dedicate that much time on a weekend to a long ride, I absolutely recommend doing one of those every week or every two weeks. Sounds like the man's going to be ready for Leadville right there. Oof. <laughs> um, Bjorn asked, uh, does performance analytics import other outside rides for analysis? Yes, that's the whole point, mm -hmm. is that we pull in all of your outside rides. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I didn't say is, uh, probably too late now, <laughs> on the podcast, but if you don't have a power meter, you can estimate your TSS for every ride. It There's prompts a tool you to, to do, do so. It. Yep. A little tool for it. Uh, Kevin's, and we'll probably make this one close to the last one uh, just for time where we're at. So Kevin says, what's the best way to raise max FTP and not caring about weight gains? Would the surplus calories from extra food help with recovery? He says, I'm trying to be like Thor minus the hair. <laughs> Well, you don't want to accumulate too much of a surplus. Now, that's just going to end up being fat gain. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're doing more work, you can absolutely eat more. And Nate's a testament to that. He's been doing a ton of sweet spot, ton of muscle endurance, which mm -hmm. is high burn stuff. He uses a lot of calories, and he's been ingesting a lot of calories, but he's been keeping a good balance because his body weight hasn't fluctuated. Mm -hmm. So power's just come up. His, his performance has just improved, but his body weight has stayed, and his body composition, more importantly, has stayed just the same. Yeah. In my mind, it's not just about more, but the qu the quality of what you're eating too. Yeah, I think that sure. a lot of guys, you know, you see like the 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 meathead gym guy, like he's like just bulk. Like I go to McDonald's and I get yeah. 17 McChickens. No. You know, what Stover's I mean? frozen <laughs> lasagna yeah. for yeah, one exactly. family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eat that. And it's and just taking in junk calories like that, it's not going to to. If you really are focused on raising power, you need to put high quality stuff in you because mm -hmm. uh, your body is going to need to do a lot of work and you need to to recover from that work and it's it yeah, a lot of the times you might not actually even need more food just better quality food yeah mm -hmm. yeah um zach asked said is there a bug with the ramp test formula in the app he had a friend where it came back at 77 percent, and he thought that the new formula was 75 yes for uh i think for one day on all platforms but ios ios i think was two or three days because of the release cycle mm -hmm. we had it in there at 77 um it was a typo by an engineer we should have emailed everyone that did it uh i'm i'm this, we did email everyone who did it mm -hmm. um, with the wrong version, what their new FTP would really be. Yeah. It was a hard email to send. <laughs> Tell everybody. <laughs> you made a mistake. <laughs> Honestly, well, two. Your and FTP's your FTP's lower. not that high. That, is yeah. hard. that so hurts everybody. Right? Hard pill. <laughs> hard pill. Um, uh, from Kevin again, he says, I'm on the specialty phase now, I, and I love 130% plus intervals, more than sweet spot. With the new analytics for 10, 30, Ooh, I just got jumped with a large comment. 10, 30 second, or 10 and 30 second and one minute power. How can I know what my best type of power to know? Or I assume what he's saying is, how do I know which power or which duration is the best one to focus on? Really, Kevin, it depends on the type of racing you're doing. And you're saying that you like 130 plus inter, or 130 percent plus intervals, but know the courses that you plan to race, know the durations that you're going to need to put out and that really matter on race day. And that's the sort of stuff that you'll really want to focus on. That's the cool thing with PRs, like we talked about yesterday, is you can get really granular with that, and you can really understand how you're improving at a specific time if, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, you're know you doing a specific criterion and you know how long that'll last in that sprint. Adam asked a good question. <clears throat> I'm going to paraphrase, but basically he's he has an idea about getting TSS in different zones. And his kind of point is not all TSS is the same. Because mm -hmm. if I were to do it all in zone five, wouldn't that be different than all in zone two? Absolutely. We completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we want to build a system to improve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's but like, I'd we also can't say go into that that's farther. A little ways out. I'd yeah. also say that's where the PRs coupled with that. Like, yeah, it helps, again, right? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. like you look at your training stress chart, right? And you see the big picture. 
And then when you click on that, you can see how that training stress was actually created, like wh how it came about. And that's so important. And usually a lot of the time you just see the, the graph and it's kind of disconnected. But in this case, you just click in that specific spot and it'll show you how that TSS was made, like exactly mm -hmm. how it was And made. then you can see the PRs you get for that. And exactly. if you're, if you're not. Exactly. And if you're still getting more PRs, then probably Where what you should do, want to get PRs. Yep. And yep. what you're doing is good. Yep. But if you're not- It's effective training. Then you want to look back at it and say, well, maybe I did it. I had, a, I had a 600 TSS week, but it was all zone two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking for one minute power PRs because mm -hmm. I'm a crit racer. Like totally. that should be, I know that sounds obvious, mm -hmm. but sometimes, especially looking at your own stuff, you, you miss obvious things. Yeah. Oh, right? totally. If you like, just look at the ebb and flow of that training stress chart, it, it only tells you so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, you have to dig into the composition of what those weeks are. Yep. Yep. And because 500 it, TSS of riding at 60% doing long slope distance does not yield mm -hmm. the same, or this does not place the same strain on the body as 500 TSS of VO2 max repeats. I think a really good thing to do is look where you've had the best improvements. Yes. Because we, we have an, uh, the FTP change on it. And then go look back and mm -hmm. see what you were doing to get the best improvements, how yep. steady you were being, and then what type of workouts you were doing. Yep. Look at the ride notes. Hopefully you left them. Yeah. Look into that, right? Like yeah. It's, it's really helpful. Let's leave off there. I think that's a good spot. It's great. Awesome. Okay. Cool. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We're looking forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, we'll talk to you then. Happy training. Enjoy the Giro. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody.